Welcome to the Purpose and Profit Club podcast for nonprofit leaders, mission-driven creatives, and social entrepreneurs. Get ready to stop dreaming and start doing. Here, ideas become action. We prioritize purpose and profit. You ready? Let's go. Whether you're a for-profit, a nonprofit, or maybe an entrepreneur who's waiting for a nudge to launch your big idea, today's podcast is for you. One of the things that I loved about this conversation with Micah is she naturally shares so many thoughts she thinks on purpose without even realizing it. There are so many nuggets of wisdom that she shares through her entrepreneurship journey that I know you can apply whether you're a fundraiser, a marketer, or a founder. Enjoy. Micah Harris has always been enamored with beautiful things and making things beautiful. She's a serial entrepreneur, certified yoga teacher, and creates physical and mental environmental spaces to tap into your unique gifts and intuition in order to create a life that reflects your deepest values and goals. Her current venture, Highbrow Hippie, is an extension of how she lives her life on a daily basis and represents the things that are most important to her. I'm so excited to welcome her to the podcast. So tell us about Highbrow Hippie and your vision and a bit about what you do today. Currently, I live in LA and I opened Highbrow Hippie, which is a um, conscious lifestyle brand for people who care about themselves and their surroundings. Uh, My partner is a hair colorist and she's been doing it for a really long time. So we always say that our... um, Our brand has its roots in beauty. Both of us come from a beauty background. One of my most recent endeavors was also in the beauty space. And so now we have what we refer to as our atelier out here in Venice, California, where we do hair services. Um, We have a curated retail area. We were doing events and I was teaching yoga there pre-COVID, but now it's... um, we're not doing that so much anymore. We just started with another event. So I think we'll get back to that as well. But um, yeah, it's really just a, a great place to come and hang out. And, you know, I think that's what makes it so different, though. I just want everybody to understand, like, it's not just a place to get your hair cut and colored, like, in, and th- it never has been like you just had this MLK day gathering, right? Where it was a place for conversation and connection and community. And there's also the the shop too. So it's very much, it's more than that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, that was definitely always our intent when we started was to have a space that was not, you know, a typical, you know, salon, a hair salon. I mean, that sounds a little flat, Even now, as I say it, uh, we really wanted to reframe it and have a space, like you said, for gathering and for community and connection and just, I don't know, do things in a different way. Totally. And so you used to live in Atlanta here and back when, back like when this was an idea, it was you and Katie and she was in LA and you were here and you, this, what, what was always cool to me and what always stood out to me is that this was always happening. And that's not how every uh, entrepreneur thinks, meaning it wasn't just like, well, maybe one day I'll, I'll do this. It was like, I'm happening. This is happening. And what are the next steps we need to take to make it happen? And, it, and that might not stand out to you, but it stands out to me having worked with a lot of people who are founders or they're on the tip of an idea or that's like they've registered their LLC, but that's it. Do you know what I mean? And you were always taking action and you were taking action from like different coasts, like whether it was the branding, whether it was the business plan, whether it was trying to figure out the property. And I thought, talk to me about that process. Like, what was that like? And how are you like, I mean, you, you didn't live in LA, but you're like, well, I'm moving there at some point. This is happening. So like, walk (laughs) us through that. Um, Yeah, you know, we started, it was interesting because we had, um, you know, this idea mostly was generated by clients, you know, at the time I had Wax, which was um, a waxing studio in Atlanta, and Katie was working here in LA, and clients would always ask us questions, you know, like, what are you guys doing? Like, where are you traveling? You know, because we're really... 
connected, you know, by our friendship, which we've had for, you know, over two decades at this point. So, you know, it started as a blog, really right. like trying yes. to, yeah, like we started as a blog, just writing whenever we could and had the time. And then um, it never really, trying to think that was like in 2012. And then, you know, in 2015 or 14 or so late mid 2015, I think it was um, one of Katie's clients had, you know, approached her with the idea of, you know, like, you know, opening a physical space. And it's kind of interesting because um, it's something that she and I had spoken about before, you know, for her, it's like, you should just open your own place, you know, because I was doing it in Atlanta and I was like, just open your own place. But it felt, um, you know, kind of overwhelming, you know, at that time. And so we decided to partner up and kind of grow this idea of Highbrow Hippie from a digital blog into a an actual location. So we worked on that for a couple of years, had some ups and downs with investors um, that didn't work out well. So parted ways and then just went at it on our own and then ended up opening in 2019, eight months before COVID. Okay. So we're definitely going to get to that, the COVID, the COVID, the COVID shutdown. So at the point where it was like that first big I'm going to call it like a speed bump, but I'm sure it felt more like a brick wall where it was like, you know, had investors, had to part ways. How did you, there are so many entrepreneurs that would have gone, I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm done. It's done. And almost like, well, we've tried and sort of like we fell, we got down, we got back, but like, and given up at that point. So how did you navigate through that resiliently and you also had the momentum to keep going so that it was like well everything that we've learned between I'm going to just however many years it took you to get to that point was not for nothing like actually we have a lot of data we have a lot of what we need to get us to where we want to go so how are you able to do that when yeah it was a setback I think you know, when you have a good idea and we knew that we had a good idea, it was kind of like, oh, this has, it'll happen, you know, like it'll happen. It kind of has to come to fruition. There's also um, a bit of ego in it too. You know, when you've gone through something with another person and they kind of, they don't really see it and you're like, I'm going to show you mm-hmm. that you're wrong. So you, <laughs> you use know? that for fuel. You use that yeah. for fuel. Yeah. Yeah. You that. know, sometimes you, you do you know, let your haters be your motivators or whatever people might say. But, um, you know, that was part of it. And, you know, for me, I feel as though I'm just, I I really exist at this axis. I, I find that I work best where I'm, you know, seeing a big picture, bringing an idea to fruition um, and and really just um, learning something new. Like I work well in that space, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, and the, you know, oftentimes the tangible act of creating something, whether it's a space, whether it's a brand, you know, a vibe. So that really suits me. And so I think that because I was still kind of working in that space, we just decided, okay, well, we'll just keep going at this on our own. And we kind of took the the time to we didn't go back to ground zero because we had, you know, so much of it done, but we really took the time at that point when we parted ways with our investor to dig in more to what this brand was going to be and kind of, you know, getting it, uh, distilling it down into a way that was more um, digestible for other people and also for ourselves. So, you know, we put together a brand deck, you know, which we hadn't done to that point. And we put together financials, but we hadn't done like a very in-depth brand deck. So we did that. And that kind of just kept it, you, it kept that excitement going of like, oh yeah. yeah, this is a really good idea and bringing on a creative team. And, you know, we were just like, I don't care if we don't have a space, let's get this logo done. Let's, you know, uh-huh. redo, you know, keep going with the iteration of the brand in the way that we saw it. There's so many places I want to go, but first I have to say like, you have 
some of the thoughts that you've been saying are basically like in this, it's done, which is what I kind of started with, like the belief that it's happening. This is a good idea. And a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of founders, they get tripped up when they hear people go, nah, that's not going to work. Or mm, when they hear the nose and it's like, you had your own, it's like you had your own back through this where you're like, it's okay that you're not sure about it. It's okay that you haven't seen this idea before. And that's what makes it such an incredible idea. That's why I know it's going to work. And it's like, you had your own self-confidence first, right? And you weren't yeah. looking outward. So it's like, what would you say to somebody like, where did that come from in you? Or like, how are you able to channel that or, or create it for yourself? I think probably a lot of it comes from having like very supportive and also creative entrepreneurial parents, you know, mm -hmm. who, you know, my dad is also an entrepreneur. He's had his own architectural firm. He doesn't have it now. He's retired, but, you know, for many years and, you know, I watched him have fun with a lot of things. You know, I watched him do things that, you know, people would say he couldn't do or he shouldn't do it that way. And, you know, I've always lived my life a little bit outside of the box. You know, I yeah. don't really think that much about what other people say is possible or it's not possible. It's like, if I can see it, then it's like, oh, well, we'll figure out a way to get it done. And when I decide that it can't be done, then, okay, you know, I'll move on to something else, you know, but as long as that opportunity is there and I can see a way that it can come together, I'll just, as long as it's still interesting and something I want to do, I'll keep trying. Yeah, totally. I, I wondered that too. I, both of us have those entrepreneurial roots. So my dad's the same way. It's like he had one main business, but he definitely started and stopped different, different other things. It was like for a minute, he had two, three locations and then he had his main location in Atlanta. And I think one of the things that I learned from him and continue to learn from him is how willing to take risks he was and not necessarily in a careless way, but in a way where it was like, yeah, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to see if this is going to work. And I think that that has having that growing up was very, very eye opening and just like, oh, he's just going to do his own thing, you know? And, and I think that part, I'm guessing that's part of what it was too for you. Yeah. You know, I, I do hear that, you know, I have, I have a couple of friends who are always like, I could never like, you know, they, they are like corporate, you know, yep. I want to check yep. every two weeks. Like I couldn't live the way that you live kind of with the sense of uncertainty and, you know, you're responsible for a lot, but for me, I almost couldn't live the other way, you know, part of the fun is taking a risk and, you know, I think you also have to have the outlook on life, right? That everything is just this, it's, it's this ongoing transfer of energy, right? So it's like money, all of these things, like it comes and it goes, you know, it's like yeah. you can have a lot of it and, you know, maybe you take a risk and it doesn't work out. Okay. Well, you know, that's gone, but I made this again. I can, it's gone. I can make something else again, you know? And I think once you have a success or two under your belt too, then that's helpful. Right, you know, right. kind of keeps you going saying, all right, well, I was right once before. So hopefully yeah, that, I'll right that confidence builds and was wax your first business or was there something before that? Uh, so prior to that, so I went to, um, school, I finished at Parsons school of design and design marketing and management. And then I came back and I worked for I worked for myself for a little while doing, um, I called myself a style broker. I would do like help um, designers, like smaller brands, like right out of school with marketing and, you know, kind of helping yep. them to, to get their brands going. And then I realized that didn't really work because they don't have any money to pay you, <laughs> even though it's fun and it's great. So, you know, I was working with my dad, um, for a while and he had a construction management firm another business an offshoot of his architectural firm which had been kind of like going along but it wasn't doing anything great and so I thought well maybe if like with a rebrand and a new uh -huh. kind of like breath of fresh air and a perspective you know it could become something again so I did that for a while um and then 
sold that. I was living in Europe doing styling work. And then when I moved back from Europe, I opened wax. And so that was really fun. And then um, sold that one prior to- And wax, just for everyone, but like, there was nothing like it in Atlanta, like period, full stop. Yes? Yeah, no, I still don't think there is. I saw something this weekend and she was like, I still am like so sad that you're not there anymore. Yeah, and it's like the vibe of it. And that's the thing about, about you is- that's the purpose piece for me is it wasn't just, we're going to just have a waxing studio for waxing sake. It was the entire experience from when you walk in the door, the entire vibe of it, of it was very you, which before we got started, I was writing down. I was like, Micah, 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 effortlessly cool. Like that is, (laughs) you're very like cool, easy. That's your vibe. And, and very clean lines, like, and highbrow hippies that way too. So, um, yeah, wax was very, very cool. And I think that, yeah. yeah, that was probably the foundation piece of like, yeah, like you said, having some wins under your belt as you got ready for for your move out to LA. Yeah, yeah. And it was fun to do. I mean, because like I said, I like bringing those things to kind of fruition, you yeah. know, it's like, oh, well, this will be cool. And it's all about it, the music and it's the brand and it's the decor. And, you know, what are we looking like it, it's everything, you know, and just creating um, that experience for people and like the vibes, like you said, is, is very fun and important to me. How would you say, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to go from the lens of starting something new. So mm-hmm. whether it's a small business, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's just your idea, ground zero, right? Starting wax, starting highbrow hippie. How do you build community clients? How do you get those first few people to come through the door and then come back? Having done it twice now, talk about that a bit. Well, I feel these, these are two between wax. I was new to newer, you know, and I'm from Atlanta, but having moved back there after living in Europe for a while, I felt like I didn't have any community. So that was kind of really like, I'm going to open the doors and see who comes, you know, like, thank goodness. Um, you know, we got a a write up in daily candy, you know, right when we opened. So that was, uh, a helpful, um, highbrow hippie was a lot different because Katie had an existing clientele in LA that she was taking at another, Uh, Mm -hmm. salon. So that was a great, you know, easy migration of them to Mm -hmm. kind of create that, that foundation. Um, But I honestly, it's always just been word of mouth, you know, like people just kind of find you. And I think part of that is being active in the community that you exist in. Yep. Um, You know, I've always lived within walking distance of both of my businesses. So the business that I mean, the community that my business is in is also the community that I'm in. Yep. So, you know, you see people and you're around and, and then they, you know, you start chatting. Well, what do you do? Well, I do this and I have this place. Oh yeah, I've seen that place. Or, oh yeah, I've heard of that place, you know? And it just, people just start to come. You, you make know? it sound, I know, but you make it sound so easy and effortless. And here's what I mean. So I'll get on coaching calls with founders in particular. And one of the, one of the primary thoughts they have is, well, I don't want to bother people or hound people, or they already know what I do. I don't want to bug them. Right. Um, And I'm like, everyone needs to know about this. Everyone needs to know what you're up to and not just once. Yeah. And it's not, it's not like you're um, like hustling them. You're not like, come in, come in, come in. But in just like, that's Christina, that's what she does. Like, and she loves what she does. Like you said, she's hanging out here in the community. And I think there's a little bit of this, like, particularly if, if I'm thinking of my nonprofit fundraisers of like, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to hound people. I asked them once and it's like, you're doing you a disservice. You're doing your, your mission a disservice um, by, by staying quiet and like shutting up. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. My ex-husband would always say, he was like, you can work the fact that you own like a waxing studio into pretty much any conversation. Yes. And I was like, yeah, I can. <laughs> you know, if it's appropriate or, you know, and I'll find, you know, kind of that, that way to drop it or to say it, because why not? You know, it's like, if nobody else is going to promote your business the way that you can promote it. 
And there is magic in that. Like there is magic because you never know who you're talking to. Like you never know who is the editor of that publication you've been trying to get into. I'm, I'm going to have my dad sit down for this podcast because specifically he came with me one day to go on like carpool run to pick up the kids. And we took them to my son's playground afterwards. And I watched him strike up a conversation with just a dad, a dad that I knew, a dad that I've known for like a couple of years. And oh my God, the two of them had this connection and they knew each other from, I was like, you're a master at conversation. You're a master at connection, connecting people. And there is an art to it. And it, and it's, it's missed by a lot of people because I think their primary thought is like, oh, no one wants to hear about that. Or I've already said it, or I'm going to sound awkward or all of those things that get in the way. And it's like, like fundamentally, number one, no, that's not true. Number two, it's like, most of us need a wax anyway, or most of us, like you said, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, it just, it's when you get out of your own way, it becomes a lot easier too. Yes. Yes. Totally. Agreed. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a bit about 2020. You opened and then you had to shut down and then maybe even just post 2020, what is the like, uh, to walk us through a bit of that. Like you had to shut down, I know for a long time here right. in California and right. maybe coming out of that, what, what, what that experience has been like. Well, you know, we, we did have to shut down for a long time in California. I mean, we were the first state to go into lockdown and one of the first businesses ordered to close and the, one of the last type mm -hmm. of businesses ordered to open or allowed to open just because of the nature of what we do um, being so, you know, in such close contact with people. So, you know, it was really tough. I mean, we were definitely closed, you know, we closed in March and then we were allowed to reopen in July to do not color services, but styling services. Um, we have an outdoor patio, which has been really helpful for us throughout this time. And, you know, Katie and I laugh because people come in, they're like, oh, you guys are so lucky. And it's like, we're not lucky. Like we wanted a patio. Like we, that was part of our design. On purpose, aesthetic. on purpose. On purpose, not yes. because of COVID, because we didn't know what that looked like, you know, when we were looking for and designing a space, but we knew we wanted to be outdoors because you can't, we're talking about hair color and natural lighting, you know? So it's like, why would we be indoors with, you know, fake lights when we can be out. I mean, it's LA, you know, also like the weather's great. So let's be outside. So that's been a really, um, it's been really helpful for everyone to continue to feel safe. Um, even now, you know, um, and when we opened again, it was very, very busy, you know, and I know that, um, it was also very stressful because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have the close contact with clients, you know, I have the ability, I'm, you know, on my computer, or, you know, doing things on the retail side, but, you know, just for the team in general to have to, you, everybody's wearing masks and you're so close yep. to people and, you know, somebody coughs and you're like, am I going to get COVID? You know, it's so it's very, there was a lot of that. I know um, for everyone who was engaging with clients, I think now it has lessened some, but it's still, mm -hmm. it's still, it's stressful, you know, and clients have been stressed, you know, and their hair is showing it. So it's, 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 it's a lot. Oh, I mean, it's say, kind of a crazy say more about that. Does that mean more, more graying and things like that? What do you mean their hair is showing? Hair it? loss, you hair know, loss. like, yeah. and this is, you know, um, something that I hear everybody talk about a lot, like people's hair is really suffering. I mean, A, because COVID, if you've had COVID, you know, that's mm -hmm. one of the um, effects of it can be, um, yeah. and it'll come back, but also just the stress, you know, of being isolated, of worrying about getting ill, of being ill, of, you know, losing mm -hmm. friends and family. And, you know, let's not forget, you know, we also went through Black Lives Matter and George mm -hmm. Floyd and all of that. I mean, and, and it's like freaking, you know, don't get me started on the politics in America, but it's like, it's been a stressful three years. Yep. You know, yep. it's been, it's been a lot. So I think that I feel now that things are starting to settle in a way. Um, but 
I don't know. I, I don't know if this is just our baseline, you know, yeah. now from going forward, like this kind of chronic level of stress and anxiety. Um, I hope not, but I feel like, yeah, I'm picturing like tight shoulders, you know, like just chronically yeah. where you're like, Oh, yeah. I feel like you yourself though. And maybe this is just my two cents, but it seems like you handle anxiety. Well, like you seem to be handling whether this is our new normal would you say that like how do you handle the anxiety of it how do you handle the fact that you are running a business you are a mother this is going on politically like there's all this stuff mm -hmm. um what's that like well for me I have a lot of uh tools that I use to kind of manage and mitigate anxiety um yoga and meditation it's one of them like I'm a yoga teacher I've been practicing for many years um I have also just really lean into the the idea that there's just a large variety of things that we don't have control over and the only mm -hmm. thing I really do have control over is how I react to it mm -hmm. you know so I can choose to let it take me under and stress me out you know I can ruminate on these thoughts over and over again in my head or I can try really hard to say ah I'm not going to think about that right now, or I'm not going to, you know, let that impact me in this moment because I'm going to choose to focus on, on something else. And that I think is, is a huge part of it. It's like, yeah, it is hard. You know, it's hard to run a business and hard to have a kid and hard to, you know, deal with COVID and, you know, all of the outlaying uh, effects of that. But I don't know. It, it's, also, at the end of the day, I, I have such a, a a strong sense of positivity as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's going to be fine because I've been through bad shit before. You know uh -huh. what I mean? It's like some I'm still here. You know, uh -huh. like it's never nothing has ever worked out the worst the way that I thought it would. You know, like the worst case the scenario, the catastrophizing it. of it. Yeah, is always. Yeah the way that we picture it is always a thousand times worse than a thousand times worse, you know, yeah. than what it can be. And sometimes, you know, that is one of the tools, like when you're really like stressed out about something, it's kind of laying it out. It's like, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? And once you start doing that, you realize, okay, well, it's really, it's not that bad. Like what's the worst thing that can yeah. happen, you know? Okay. You know, I'm out X amount of dollars this person decides to move on and do something whatever it is you know yeah. and you're like but I'll still be okay yeah you know yeah I'll still I just, be okay. I know that our I know our listeners are just going to be like there's so much here because the way that you think is there are times where I'm like I want to teach people how to think like a successful entrepreneur and you're naturally saying thoughts that are that which is like you're not catastrophizing. You're not thinking of all the reasons it won't work. Everything the, that you've talked about are all the reasons it will work. And not even like the way that you built this business is not like, well, I think it'll, I think one day this will work. You're like, it's going to fucking work. I'm going to make yeah. this happen. Yeah. And if, and, and if we have to, to, to pivot or tweak, or we're going to do that and we're going to test and there's going to be some bumps, but it's, it's happening. It's, and that energy around it is like this calm, secure, confident energy. And people are attracted to that. Like people want to go hang out there. Um, people don't want to go hang out at the place where the owner's stressed. Like you feel that when you come in the door, like you yeah. feel that. Like, yeah. 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 And the owner's like nervous and what's, you know, frazzled. And frazzled. Yes. It's like, nobody wants to be in that space. You know, you, people want to come into a space where they they can let some of their stress and, you know, anxiety go because they are in this space that feels calm and grounded, you know, in a, in a different way. So, and this is the same energy though, the way that you would pitch a funder, the way that you would pitch a potential partner, this is that same energy of like, the person is going to be much more likely to say yes to you because you believe in you. And because you have that calm energy versus like this tight, tense, insecure, I feel like I'm bugging them energy. And so that is, that is really one of the, the primary reasons I, I wanted you on here because you're very unique in that way where you're like, it's good. I got this. It's I, done. Got it. I got, I got it. it. I got, got it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a bit about the shop because we really haven't gone there, which is 
which is your zone, right? Talk to us about the highbrow hippie shop, like the, the, the sustainable elements, some of the, some of the um, vendors and there's also um, vintage pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, when we, so traditionally, right. If you think about like a hair salon, you know, it's like they have shampoos and conditioners, maybe some candles, you know, something like that. And we wanted it to really be like from day one, just the name highbrow hippie kind of invokes more than a hair salon, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's just, it really is indicative of uh, an outlook on life, you know, and kind of this tension between high and low. So that's really where we are. So when we selected products to go into the space, you know, one of them was that um, we wanted them to have a sustainable element. You know, we want them to be unique. It's a lot of smaller um, brands, manufacturers, local ones out here in LA. Um, Yeah, we've done a couple like pop-ups with vintage dealers. And so they'll bring in vintage things that people can purchase. Um, You know, it's interesting because that's one of the areas of the business. We launched our online shop during COVID because we were closed, right? So it's like, okay, how can we get people to like buy stuff online? And that for me has been a big learning curve because I never, it's a whole, it's a completely different business, right? Like it's totally different than you know, the, the trends on our website are different than the trends within the, the physical location, like what people buy. It's it's very interesting. So trying to navigate both of those and, you know, really realizing that it's competitive out there on an, in yeah. an online space and you really have to like find your your way. And um, so that's that's been a learning curve for me. And I think that I'm still trying to figure it out, you know, um, but yeah, you know, it's, we have crystals, we have candles, we have, you know, shampoos, conditioners, we have rugs, we have pillows, hand soaps, all types of stuff. CBD and it's, stuff. it's very curated again to that vibe, like that overall aesthetic. And that's, that's what I love about it. That, that makes it so different. And so very uniquely you, and that makes sense too, about it's like the audience who you serve in person is different than the audience who is, I would guess all around the country. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's interesting to kind of see what people are drawn to here and what people are drawn to there. Um, Yeah, but it's fun. You know, when we started Highbrow Hippie way back in the day, and we were trying to like get all of our thoughts um, out one of the things that we always said it would be like where beauty and wellness intersect. Yep. So those are the underpinnings of the brand. It's beauty, wellness, and conscious living. It used to be beauty, wellness, and living. And then as we moved forward and you know um, opened our space, we added that word conscious there because it seems to um, uh, describe a lot of the way that we that we view things. You know, it's not just about living, but you know that conscious lens that we view things through. So that's been really, it's been great. So that our our retail is set up in that way. There's beauty, there's wellness, and there's conscious living. And it's set up that way on the website as well. So let's talk about what's next. Like, what does this year look like? What's the vision for, for next year and beyond? Well, right now, you know, we're really have just been trying to steady the ship and get a real sense of what this business looks like. Um, this was our first full year, 2022, without yeah being in business, without having some type of close downs for COVID or, you know, we didn't open until late uh, 2019. So right now we're working on a product line, you know, for Highbrow Hippie yes. um, that we hope to have the first ones out prior to the end of this year. Um And that's really it. I mean, that's been our main focus. You know, that's a pretty heavy lift. And, you know, how do we translate the feeling and the ethos of Highbrow Hippie into something tangible for people to take home? Um, Yeah, that's been it, you know, and just being being a mom and all that that entails. So that's maybe my almost last question, which is 
anytime I hear the word balance, I'm just like, I don't know. When people are like, how do you handle work-life balance? I'm like, I'm not sure there is a balance. I don't know. But maybe the way to say it is as an entrepreneur who has this thriving business, who has employees, who has payroll to meet, who has all of these things and caretaking and self-care, which isn't always like a facial, but it's like, to me, it's like you time, like you time. How does that look? Like, how do you prioritize it? How do you handle it? So tell us about that. Well, for me, a, you know, it's nice to have a partner in business, you know, so that one person isn't spread so thin, you know, if there's something that comes up and one person can't handle it, you have another person that can, um, you know, jump in if necessary. So that's really helpful. Um, For me personally, I'm big on systems and like structure, you know, as kind of like free flowing as I am. (laughs) Yeah. That's surprising to hear, right? (laughs) It is. It is because I'm very, you know, like chill and, you know, yeah, easy, but I'm also pretty structured around my systems and, and the way that I do things. So, you know, a big thing for me is just looking like each day, like I do certain things on certain days, you know, and I schedule out blocks in my calendar, like I know that I have a lot of writing that I need to do for blogging or things. All right, friends, she's batching. She is batching. (laughs) Yes, I'm batching it. Are you doing it even though you don't feel like doing it? So if you wake up on a Wednesday and you're supposed to do it, do you do it anyway? Do you stay do you stay committed? Most to of the time, okay. most of the time, there are some kind of like non-negotiables like Mondays or finance, you know, I work That's what I mean. Home. Yep. It's quiet. So it's like that stuff just, it has to happen. Yep. Um, there might be times where, you know, somebody wants to cut in on my blogging, you know, uh-huh, block, uh-huh. And it's like, okay, I, I will condense it. And, and, and do that. But, you know, I find that as long as I'm continuing to do that, that it works for me. I also have a hard start and a hard stop at the end of my day. That's good. You know, I I really do. And I try not to go back on my computer at night, like definitely not for work stuff, you know, like, unless I absolutely have to, and there's something that's so pressing, but again, that, that, that it's you like know. the guard, the, it's guardrails. It's like the systems, the fact that you're batching this fact that you stay within mostly the, the constraints of your calendar. Like those all might seem like things that are like, Oh, that's really strict and regimented, but that actually is what gives you the like space to be on when you're on and off when you're off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I'm pretty, I have like I do not get email. Not- I have no notifications for anything, not for text, not for Instagram, not for emails, for n- nothing, you know? And so it's like, I don't look at that. This is why unless- I love you. <laughs> I spent like 20 minutes trying to, to get off the notifications on my Apple mail. And I did like oh, off good. my desktop. So yes. if I ever accidentally leave it open, like I'll never know if an email came in unless I physically go, it's time to check my email because yeah. those are those are the the things that just take us off the space of like creating or doing or whatever. And it just puts us in a, a, what is that? Uh, task switching. Like it just- Yeah, yeah, you're so in a time. reactive state. And that's why, it's yeah. also why I don't check my emails until, unless I know there's somebody I need to get back to earlier. But yeah. typically I don't even look at my emails until noon, you yeah. know? And then it's like, I'm scrolling through because otherwise everybody else's problem becomes my problem in the morning. And then I'm doing, I'm reacting to what they need me to be doing instead of doing what I wanted to do yep, or what um, I needed to do. So yeah. So many lessons here. So many. <laughs> All right. Um, last question, which is what is some, one thought that you think on purpose? You actually said quite a few. So some people might view this as like a mantra or an affirmation or just a thought that you like to think on purpose. I mean, gosh, there's so many things that I think on purpose. I know when things get tough, you know, one of the things I'm always like, okay, and this too shall pass. Like it's, it's this too shall pass. You know, I think about that a lot. And I also think about, I don't know, this is hard. Like, what do I think about all 
the time, you know, it's like. So one of the ones you said in the beginning or earlier was just basically like, I know this is a good idea. I know this is going to work. And I don't even think you realize how well practiced that thought was and how often you, you think it, but you probably thought it a, a lot in the past few years. And so many founders get stuck. Cause they're thinking the opposite. They're thinking, is this going to work? I, you know, it's like, I hope this is going to work, which is a very different feeling. Right. And, and a very different experience of building something, starting something. Yeah. I think there is a way, um, for me and of tapping into like that, that intuitive side of myself. Like I will, I will refer to myself as like an intuitive strategist too, because sometimes I can't tell you why. I don't think that's going to work or why this is not the, yep. this is not the stopping point. I just know that that's not it yet. You know, it's like, I know we can push this further or I know oh, yeah. it's not right sitting yet, but you know, when you I, get, I think that that's yourself. there, it's like that gut check. Um, and I think so often we're leaning on like a mentor, a leader, a, an expert, an author to be like, I have to follow this strategy to the T. And I'm always like, take what you want, leave the rest and ask yourself, like, do that gut check of like, what do I want? What does this actually land? Because there's a thousand different ways to do something. So it's like, what is the way you want to do something? Right. And I mean, and ultimately at the end of the day, if you're in business for yourself, you're setting up a business that works for you, right? Like you're, it's like, I don't want to set up a business that I'm working for it. Like I can structure it. However, I want to structure it. However, works best for me in my life. And that can change as time goes on, you know, like you were talking about balance, like sometimes you're going to be really into it and you're going to have a lot of um, creativity and and energy around it. Sometimes you're going to be like, you know, like I need to kind of step away for a moment to clear my head and kind of think through some things and, and sort it so that you can come back with the fresh you know, perspective and energy and and ideas and all of that. So it ebbs and it flows, you know? Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And last thing. Okay. Where can everybody find you? Give us the like social handles, all the things. Okay. You can find me on Instagram at Micah Harris, M-Y-K-A-H-A-R-R-I-S. You can find Highbrow Hippie on Instagram at Highbrow Hippie. H-I-G-H-B-R-O-W-H-I-P-P-I-E. Also online, highbrowhippie.com. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Those are all the same. And if you're in LA, go hang exist. out. Yeah, and if you're in LA, we're down here in Venice. So check us out, send us a message. Yeah, go online, all yes. the things. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. You know how they say... You should enjoy the journey, not just the destination. Have you ever wondered, how do I crack the code to do that? I can help you do that. I can help you not only achieve your biggest, most daring goals, but the journey to get there. No more overwhelm, no more self-doubt. I want to invite you to book a call with me. Go to splendidatl.com forward slash book. Think you've reached out to everyone in your network? Are you out of ideas to get noticed and get funded? I hear you. That's why I'm giving you a chance to steal my prospect list. Yes, you can generate leads for your nonprofit or impact-driven business. Grab my mini training and list delivered to your inbox instantly. Go to splendidcourses.com forward slash prospect.